Good morning, everybody. Can you believe we are rapidly approaching the end of 2022 and the beginning of a new garden season? Last year, I created a series of videos sharing my favorite vegetable, herb, and annual flower varieties from the 2021 gardens. But a few folks expressed that they wished I would have shared that a little bit earlier as they'd already done most of their seed shopping for the following year. So this year, I'm trying to do just that. Today's video is part one of two of my 2022 favorites from the garden. And this year I'm trying to kind of go in chronological order based on ripening time, except for flowers. They kind of get all lumped together at the end. So be sure to stay tuned for part two as well. But first I'm gonna add a few disclosures and these are the same things that I talked about in last year's videos. The first is that I am a seed trial manager by trade. So a lot of the things that I trial every year are coming directly from seed companies and breeders. And for that reason, some of the varieties that I mention may not be readily available available from your normal retailers, say your seed company catalogs like Johnny's or Gurney's or Burpee's or your local garden center. But I do try to mention for each variety if there is a retail source available. Sadly, I realized that I had far fewer varieties to share this year, primarily because a larger portion of the stuff I was trialing is still in the developmental stages. Now, there's a lot of good stuff in the pipeline, I can tell you that, and I will share it as soon as I'm able. But just to give you guys an idea, here's a quick scroll through of the varieties that I'm looking at. And you can see with a lot of these that still have like letter and number codes, these are things that have not actually been released to the public yet. And the second thing I wanted to mention is that these are only my favorites that I actually grew in 2022. I've been keeping track of my trial favorites every year since 2012. So if you don't hear a variety in a certain vegetable or herb or annual flower category, and you'd like a suggestion for a variety that does well in this region, drop a line in the comments below and ask me about it. Chances are I probably have one from a prior year. And be sure to also check out that series of videos from 2021. And one last thing I wanted to mention before we jump in is that most varieties tend to be regionally adapted, meaning that what does well for me here in Ohio in zone 6A may not do as well for someone in the Southwest or the Pacific Northwest or even the East Coast, even if you happen to be in the same zone as me. Through the years, I have seen a few varieties that do well in a multitude of diverse growing areas, but that is the exception, not the norm. Your individual soil and microclimate are going to greatly affect how any given variety performs, not to mention the specific disease and pest pressures that you have in your area. So while I encourage anyone to try the varieties that I'm going to mention, just keep that point in mind. So let's jump into my favorites from the 2022 garden. Now to jump off the season, my first favorite was a variety of spinach called Patton. Now, one of the tricks to having success with spinach here in Ohio is growing it during the cool weather. So getting it planted out early enough in the season so that it's maturing before the heat of summer sets in. In the fall, it's the same way, getting it planted late enough so that you're avoiding the heat, but before those really freezing cold temperatures set in. But it helps massively to choose a variety that is stress tolerant and bolt resistant. That way, when we have that inevitable weird 80 degree warm spell in the middle of April, your spinach plants aren't wanting to bolt immediately. From what I have seen in my own gardens, Patton has great bolt resistance. It also has downy mildew resistance, which is important because downy mildew in spinach tends to favor cool, wet conditions, which as you can imagine, if you're growing in the spring or the fall, those are typically the kind of conditions that you have during those periods where you're growing spinach. And I know, I know, all that's great, but the important thing, how does it taste? Well, if you like spinach, you're gonna love Patton. It is really rich deep green leaves with a nice meaty almost succulent texture and a mild but good flavor. I can't stand a spinach leaf that just wilts away shortly after you pick it and there are a lot of varieties that tend to do that but Patton does not. It holds up really well, it holds well in the refrigerator, it makes a really nice salad but it's also good for cooking. Though unfortunately as is the case with all other spinaches you can start with what feels like 17 cups of Patton spinach, cook it down, and you end up with a tablespoon, but it's a delicious tablespoon. 
Next up is Zeppo Beet. I think I took 200 pictures of this beet this past growing season. I personally love the looks of a nice big round beet and Zeppo did not disappoint. Zeppo has nice, big, tall, lush, healthy tops, which are great for eating. And the roots are uniformly round and nearly free of feeder roots. Those little tiny hairy roots that sometimes form all over the bottom of beets, which can kind of give them that unkempt look. And Zeppo wasn't just a pretty face. I found that it had very high sugars, a rich flavor, and just a hint of that earthy geosmin that really makes for a good beet. I also found that they held well in the garden without getting woody. Now another cool season leafy green winner for me this year was Casper Kale. And this is one that I have grown repeatedly in my garden. And what I find fun about Casper is that during the warm season, you think that it's just another solid green ruffle leaf kale. But as soon as that cold weather hits, bam, it becomes a show-stopping, picotty-leafed work of art. So this lovely contrast between the creamy white and the sagey blue-green color becomes very, very pronounced the colder the weather gets. But the best attribute of Casper kale is that the midribs, so the part of the plant that on normal kale, let's face it, is basically inedible, are actually very tender and sweet. So you can eat the whole leaf, cut up the whole leaf. You don't have to process those midribs and throw them out or throw them in the compost. They are quite tasty, as is the rest of the kale leaf. And like so many cold loving vegetables, that flavor and those sugars only intensify as the weather gets cooler. Now I know an awful lot of folks are just not fans of kale's eating qualities, but I will say that Casper is hands down the best eating kale that I have ever grown. And as an added bonus, it's also one of the most cold hardy kales in my garden. Now, I always like to mention cauliflower, primarily because it is not the easiest vegetable to grow here in Ohio. So when I find varieties that do well for me, I kind of want to just shout it from the mountaintops. Last year, I mentioned clementine cauliflower, which is a beautiful, vibrant, orange-headed cauliflower. This year I grew clementine again and I grew it with two other varieties, one called de purple, which is, as you can guess, a purple headed variety and a white headed variety called aerospace. Now, even in a less than ideal spring and early summer growing period, we were quite hot, had some stretches of dry weather. These three varieties were extraordinarily stress resistant. So they formed big, beautiful heads. And what I liked is that they all matured at about the same time with about the same size and shape head. So they were really nice and compatible with each other. And I ended up with just a beautiful mix of cauliflower. I think the only thing that could have made this better is if I would have had some Romanesco thrown in that mix. Now, Clementine is available from Johnny's Seed and De Purple is available from Territorial. But unfortunately, Aerospace does not appear to be available in the States yet. But if you're looking for another really nice white headed cauliflower, I suggest just checking out Adana, which I mentioned last year, which is available from Territorial. Now, I also wanted to mention one non-edible favorite of my 2022 garden and thank the sponsor of today's video, Tailored Canvases. Now, you may have noticed this great personalized sign behind me here. The designers at Tailored Canvases custom created this for me, and I am going to be hanging this beauty in my office slash seed starting room slash library slash craft room for right now. But my plan is someday when I get my dream greenhouse, this is going to be the centerpiece in there. But the process of customizing this was so easy. I chose the specific size I wanted. I was able to customize the text and more. I got a proof to review before the actual canvas was sent. And the turnaround time overall was extraordinarily quick. Tailored Canvases has quite the array of different designs to choose from. I spent longer than I'd like to admit perusing all the different designs on their site. And all all of them are customizable. And overall, the print work and quality of these canvases is spot on. Now with Christmas coming up, hint, hint, this might make the perfect gift for that gardener on your list. Check out the selection at Tailored Canvases for yourself by clicking on the link in the video description below and use my code JennaB15 for 15% off your total order at tailoredcanvases.com. Now on to more veggie favorites. Now the next 
next veggie variety, depending on your preference for cheesy, punny names, either has a terrible name or a delightful name. It is Peelicious Pea. Now, names aside, I have grown this one for over five years and it never disappoints. Nice long pods filled with on average eight to 10 peas, excellent sweet flavor that holds well without getting starchy. And they are also delicious, or should I say peelicious, frozen. I also really like the plant habit. These are more of a compact variety, so they typically grow about two to three feet tall, and they're a semi-aphila type, which means that instead of putting on a bunch of foliage, they tend to put on a lot of these little tendrils. I like these little tendrils a lot because if you're growing these along a pea fence, they really tend to grab and hold on so these plants aren't gonna get knocked over by spring storms. Also, if you plant a block of them, they will start to cling to each other and become basically self-supporting. Also, because the plants are devoting less energy to creating foliage, they tend to put more energy towards producing more pods and more peas. So you end up with a higher yield overall. Now I have a lot of long-standing favorite onions, and I kind of have a favorite onion for each different application. So I love Patterson for long storage. I love Candy and Ailsa Craig for fresh eating. Red Zeppelin or Monastrell are some of my favorite reds. But this year, I found a couple of varieties that I like specifically for overwintering. So this past year I did a variety trial to see which varieties of onions would overwinter the best in my climate. And I really ended up liking Bridger onion. I like this one a lot specifically because it works well both as an overwintered onion and as a spring planted onion in my region. This yellow onion has great bolt tolerance, which is the key factor in a good overwintering onion here. It forms good sized bulbs and has moderate storage ability. So on average storing four to six months. In my overwintered onion trials, it was second only to this next variety, which I'm going to mention. And that is T448 onion, boring name, Great overwintering onion. This yellow onion had the largest bulbs of any in my overwintering trials, the highest resistance to bolting, and really thin necks, which I like because that allows the onions to cure down and store better. The one downfall is that this one does not work well for me as a spring planted onion, so I'd really only use it in that overwintering time slot. Now, interestingly, the breeding company that released this onion mentioned that it was best suited for the Pacific Northwest Columbia Basin or East Eastern North Carolina, but I have found that it performs really, really well here for me in Ohio. And a final member of the Allium family, I really liked Creme Brulee Chalion this year. Every bit as delicious as the name implies, Creme Brulee is amazing when it's caramelized. Those sugars intensify and it has no hint of any kind of an off aftertaste, like some onions or even shallots can get. Unlike a shallot, which this Chalion resembles, Creme brulee has a single centered, easy to cut bulb and is easy to grow from seed. I grow it exactly like I do my onions from seed. And that beautiful rosy color is just hard to beat. Now onto the warmer season vegetables. The first I wanna mention is quirk cucumber. And I admit this one is completely and totally about the novelty factor for me, which is unfortunate because the seed is really pricey to just be a novelty, but I'm glad that I tried it at least once. It was a lot of fun to grow this one. I was first drawn to it because the catalog description mentioned that it's highly resistant to cucumber beetle feeding damage, which I did find to be the case. The plants have a very unusual habit. They're extremely compact with short inner nodes and small foliage, and they grow only to about a compact two foot size. But they're very, very productive and produced a ton of these really cool looking little bright white and green fruit. Now I found that these are best picked at about two inches long, but they're fantastic for snacking and have no bitter flavor at all. My kids absolutely loved having these for a snack in the summer. I also grew patio snacker cucumber, which is another relatively compact variety. And this one was also remarkably productive for its compact three foot plant stature. This variety can easily be grown in a container, which worked out really well for me this year. Now cucumber beetles spreading bacterial wilt is one of the biggest issues I have with cucumbers in any given year. So this year I did my normal 
cucumber planting in ground about the middle of May and got some really great harvest up until about midsummer when the disease and insect pressure really got high. So my plants were pretty much petering out by the end of August. Well, I planted the patio snacker in a large container on the 4th of July and kept it covered with insect netting until it started to flower. By the time I removed the netting, most of those cucumber beetle populations had moved elsewhere, and I was able to get some really nice late summer harvest off of this variety with no insect pressure. And what I found remarkable about Patio Snacker was that even for the small plant size, you don't get tiny little cucumbers. I was picking on average six to seven inch long cucumbers with really nice, crisp, sweet flesh and a completely non-bitter skin. They're also very, very low in seeds. And I was so happy with the way that this worked out that my plan is to do this late season container planting with patio snacker every year from now on. Now a staple of the summer garden of course is green beans and I grow a lot of the standards but this year I changed it up a little bit and added elegance bean to the mix. Now elegance is a little different because it is a compact variety really well suited to containers or small space gardens. I had a lot of these planted in my raised beds, tucked in amongst other vegetables, basically wherever I could find room. These plants are small, really no bigger than about eight to 12 inches tall, and they have small, delicate foliage, but don't let that diminutive appearance fool you. I have rarely seen a plant put on a heavier load of beans than on elegance. But the thing to keep in mind with this variety is it is a two sieve bean. It's a smaller, more refined pod than something like your grandma's old canning beans. Now the term sieve in the industry is just the measure used to measure the width of your green bean. You can see here on this handy little measuring tool, this can give you an idea of the differences in sieve size. But my point is that you pick elegance at a much smaller size than you would your typical green bean. And this small refined size makes a really nice pod for doing something like pickling whole or my favorite preparation. I just snap these in half, steam them for just a couple minutes and then toss them with olive oil, sea salt, garlic and toasted almonds. Absolutely delicious. Another summer staple, of course, is tomatoes. And Candyland Red was a favorite in the garden this year. Now, I have grown Candyland in the past, but I decided to revisit it this year because I thought it was something that my kids might like. And they did. Well, one of them, my daughter. My son is not a fan of fresh tomatoes. But my daughter, at this point, considers herself quite the little tomato connoisseur. And Candyland was tops in her book. Now, Candyland is a currant-type tomato. But unlike your typical currant tomato, which, if left unchecked, will Will take over your garden and your barn and your house if you let it. I'm only sort of kidding. Candy Land stays a manageable four to five feet tall. It's an indeterminate, but it doesn't get as large and rangy as a typical currant will. It also sets all of its fruit around the outside of the plant, so it's much easier to pick. But what it got from its current lineage is that incredible productivity. So one tomato plant put on more little tomatoes that we could ever eat as a family of four. And the best part is that these tomatoes are intensely fruity and delicious. And that slightly smaller current size is really nice because they are the perfect size for snacking. You can throw them onto salads whole without having to cut them up. And they're great for adding to veggie trays. Now, my radar for flavor in the garden is to watch which plant that people always stop by and snack on anytime they're out in the garden. And and this year, that plant was Candyland. And finally, Safari Zucchini. Now, summer squash and zucchini are kind of one of those vegetables that it's hard to get nitpicky about. Generally, you plant them, they grow, you end up with so many zucchini that you're sneaking them onto your neighbor's porch at night. But I have pretty strict criteria for my perfect zucchini. And the first one is spineless or nearly spineless plants. I have gotten ridiculously sensitive to summer squash and zucchini scratching up my arms when I go to pick. But rather than use common sense, and wear sleeves and gloves when picking zucchini, I demand that my zucchini be spineless. The trouble is I never ever go into the garden with the intention of actually picking summer squash or zucchini. It seems to always just happen when I'm out there. And of course it's July and I'm wearing short sleeves. So anyway, my point being, that I very much appreciate the fact that Safari has spineless petioles. It does not scratch you up when you go into the plant to harvest fruit. It also has an open plant habit, so it's easier to actually get down in there and pick. 
My second criteria is that the variety have resistance to or just be less attractive to squash vine borers and squash bugs. Now, no one who sells Safari is actually claiming that it is resistant to these bugs, but this is just something that I observed in my own garden this year. I had seven other varieties of summer squash and zucchini planted this year, and at least three of those got taken down very early by squash vine borers, and the remaining plants, the squash bugs were having parties on, but Safari somehow remained healthy and productive for the entire season until I was just so sick of zucchini that I ripped it out to plant my cool season crops. It could have been a fluke, yes, but you can bet that I'll be planting this one again next year. Also, it's tasty, I guess. I don't know, I cook my zucchini with so much other stuff, usually sauteing it with onions and butter and salt, or cooking it into the cake, marauding as zucchini bread, that I don't know that there's much of a distinguishing difference between flavors in zucchini or summer squash, honestly. But this one tasted just fine in every recipe I made with it, so I am happy with it overall. And that wraps up the favorites for today's video. Be sure to stay tuned for part two of my 2022 garden favorites. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.